Hello, my name is Perrin Hamel. I'm a faculty at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and I'm one of the developers of the urban flood risk mitigation model within the Invest Suite developed by the Natural Capital Project. So today we're going to do three things. The first one is we're going to learn why one would use the Invest urban flood risk model. And number two, we're going to learn how the model works in theory, and then how the model works in practice. So let's get started with why using the urban flood risk mitigation model. We want to highlight first that there are several types of flooding. Um, one of them is the fluvial floods, uh, or also called the river or riverine floods. Um, and these are essentially when the normal river level uh, is uh, uh, exceeds the bank levels and there's water overflowing uh, the, the banks. So this is flooding coming from the river itself. Um, the second type of uh, flooding is coastal flooding uh, or storm surge. Um, and this is essentially due to large waves or storm surges um, that reach the coast uh, where people live. So this is a second uh, type of flooding coming from, uh, from the ocean. Uh, or from uh, a lake shore. Uh, the third type of flooding is uh, pluvial flooding, which um, can be flash floods uh, when there's very intense precipitation, uh, and more generally pluvial or surface water flooding. Uh, and this is actually the type of flooding that we are going to focus on today, uh, essentially when there's a lot of precipitation in a short amount of time, um, and either the soil are saturated uh, or they reach the infiltration capacity, which means that there's too much water produced at the surface of um, rural or urban areas, and this leads to local flooding. So again, this is the, the third type of flooding that we're going to focus on and that the model is designed to represent. So some important points about the, the urban flood risk mitigation model. Um, I want to highlight that it's one of several urban water related services um, to, to understand where it fits in a broader picture of ecosystem services. Um, so other water related services include stormwater runoff retention uh, over longer um, time frames, um, And this is important for water quality uh, as well as the um, long-term water cycle in an urban watershed. Uh, so the difference uh, between the model we're looking at uh, today and that one is that we are today looking at extreme events um, or, or storm events uh, when there's a large amount of precipitation for a single event. Uh, the other one is, is more for long-term uh, and water quality questions. The, the other related model is uh, or service is the groundwater recharge service, which is essentially uh, looking at how much um, the groundwater is recharged uh, through infiltration um, in pervious areas. There are a lot of alternative models, and that's the second point I wanted to, to make that's important. Um, some of them you may or may not know, um, called iTree, uh, which also looks at several ecosystem services. Um, SWIM, the stormwater um, management model. Uh, MUSIC, um, HEC, RAS, uh, other hydrologic or hydraulic mod models um, that are essentially designed to um, represent how water flows, in that case, in urban uh, watersheds. So it's important to remember that INVEST is one option uh, among many others, and very often these other modeling options would um, be more appropriate if you have a strong focus on these urban um, water-related services. Uh, and that's because these models are more sophisticated um, and will allow the user to reach higher level of accuracy. So why, why would anyone use the urban invest model in that case? Uh, two main reasons. One is that it's consistent uh, in its format, the type of outputs and inputs um, cons are consistent with other ecosystem services in invest. Uh, 
Um, so that's important when one wants to look at trade-offs and synergies for uh, different ecosystem services assessments. The second advantage is that uh, there are low data requirements. Like any other invest model, the, this one was developed with um, data scarce environments in mind, which means that um, you will always find at least global uh, data products or uh, very easily um, available uh, data products that one can use to run the model. Of course, if you have better data sets for solid data, for, for example, uh, it's, it's always better, but there's um, a minimum product that we, we believe is reasonably um, to, is reasonable to ask from, from users. So some applications, just to, to give you a, a flavor of the, the type of model outputs that the model produces. This is um, a map of the flood water retention in, in Singapore. Um, so essentially looking at which areas are retaining a, a lot of flood water, so do not contribute to, to flood hazard. Um, as opposed to uh, areas that do not retain a lot of water in lighter shades of, of grain. So this is an output at the pixel scale. You can see it's very um, fine resolution. And we can also aggregate these data at the sub-watershed level, like in this map here. Um, and we can also focus more specifically on these areas that are flood prone. So where we know there's a risk of flooding, um, it's one way to determine how important and valuable this, this service is. This is because that's an area where there has been flood uh, in, the, in the past, and, and we know that it's important to protect or enhance, uh, increase the flood retention service. Um, so this is the, the type of, of map outputs that one, one can obtain with the model. The second example I wanted to share with you today uh, is um, one in Shenzhen that uh, some of, of our colleagues from the Chinese Academy of Sciences have uh, developed with, with us. Um, and so on, on this slide here, we, we're showing two maps, one for the flood water retention service, the one we are looking at today, another one for sediment retention. Um, and this was part of an application of the model where we wanted not only the biophysical values for uh, a suite of services, but also the economic values. And um, this is part of a larger um, initiative and, and project looking at um, calculating the gross ecological product uh, for cities and more generally for provinces in, in China. Uh, so this is another application where we can translate the, this flood water um, retention service into an economic value uh, that can be used in, in such applications. So let's get an overview of the model to understand how it works. The first step of the model is essentially to look at the supply of the service. And by supply, we mean the uh, ecological functions uh, that provide the infiltration and this retention uh, service. Um, so that's the, essentially during a storm, how much of, the, of this uh, water will not be converted to direct runoff, which will in, in, uh, increase the flood hazard. The second um, area of, of uh, or component of the model is the reduction of flood water volume in flood prone areas. Uh, so that's the connection between the biophysical component and uh, the, the reduction of uh, flood water um, where there's a risk. So where the value of, of this service is actually um, assumed to be the highest. And finally, there's the, the valuation step, um, which can be calculated optionally as the avoided flood damage uh, for, for a given user. So that's the, essentially the three steps that I'm going to detail in the next slides. So for the supply, the model uses um, the 
SES curve number method, which is a widely used approach, an uh, empirically based approach um, that calculates the direct runoff. Uh, so if we look here at the graph uh, in inches or in millimeters uh, as a function of the rainfall uh, depth, uh, same thing in inches or millimeters. Um, and so the, this relationship between direct runoff and rainfall depend on what we call the curve number. Um, this curve number is uh, different for different types of land use and cover. Um, so for example, for pervious versus impervious, um, and it also depends on the soil type um, and the antecedent moisture conditions, which is uh, one parameter that uh, the model currently ignores. Um, so to, uh, to summarize, it's mainly the land use and cover, which is one of the inputs, and the, the soil type, uh, which is also a model input as provided as a raster. Um, so the model will use the, these curves to um, calculate the runoff uh, provided uh, or generated on each pixel over the landscape. And the next step is simply to aggregate. So for each pixel, this uh, peak flow or, or essentially the runoff generated by the storm event is calculated. Um, and the, these um, individual pixel runoffs are summed up to contribute to the watershed uh, runoff. And so this is an important point for, for this model. There's actually no routing. Uh, which is a simplification. So by this, I mean there's no uh, direct routing from one pixel to another with perhaps some uh, possibility for infiltration. Uh, but there's uh, essentially, uh, these processes are ignored in the model. So it's simply the sum of uh, all these uh, runoffs, which is acceptable uh, for uh, this type of model, essentially assuming that everything contributes to during this large uh, event. So th there's um, no timing um, difference between the pixels further in the watershed than those really close to the flood prone area. And the runoff retention uh, is simply the storm volume. So essentially all the water that this storm event, this precipitation brought, uh, minus the peak volume. So what is um, actually um, coming out of the, of the watershed, what runoff is, is generated. So the difference between the two is what has been retained by some of the pixels. Next, we move to the value uh, of the, the, this service. So we, we saw that um, we can focus on flood prone areas and in particular flood prone watersheds uh, to understand where this, value, this service might have the highest value. And in, if we do that, we can also look at the potential economic damage for flood risk. So the model does not um, explicitly look at the flood depth. It's only saying there's that much runoff that is generated, but we don't know if it's going to translate into uh, a large or a small uh, fl flood in terms of, of the depth of the flooding. Um, but still, if we aggregate these values at meaningful uh, units and areas, we may want to look at what is the potential economic damage if there is an important flood hazard in one area? Um, its value, the value of retention, is actually highest if the these buildings and the potential damage is is higher. So that's essentially what the model is is doing here, um, looking at the potential economic damage uh, of, of an area, um, summing economic damage for every single building that we had have the footprint for, um, and, and then looking at the potential service, which is simply multiplying runoff retention and potential economic damage. Uh, so this economic damage for all the infrastructure in, in an area. Uh, 
So if we summarize uh, the model inputs that we just um, went through, there's first the climate uh, input, which is this uh, uh, storm depth, and I wrote here design storm depth because often it's a, a choice that the model user will make uh, to focus on maybe a five year return, return period, which is a relatively frequent uh, event versus a 10 year, 50 year, perhaps, perhaps 100 uh, year um, return influence. So, statistically, a type of event that occurs every um, 100 years. Um, and these can be obtained from engineering manuals um, and what we call typically intensity, duration, frequency curves. Um, essentially looking at these um, frequencies, so if we select a 10-year flood, um, and then looking for a typical duration that um, one might select as the uh, time of concentration, so how much time it takes for a drop of rain to reach the outlet of a watershed, and this could be taken as the, the duration. The soil data are also important, as we've seen, and so it's essentially the hydrologic soil group that we need for, for this model, um, which is a categorization of soils according to their infiltration capacity. Um, and these are simply A, B, C, or D, uh, and they, they will be codified in the model um, as one, two, three, four. One for A, two, uh, four for letter D. Uh, same thing, this uh, can be from local soil data sets or global data sets. Um, finally, uh, on, the, on that side, the land use and cover um, is an important input. Uh, and as part of the land use and cover, which is a raster, we also want to provide these curve numbers that I, I mentioned, uh, which for each type of land use and cover in, uh, on our landscape in, in the raster, we, there's one specific curve number that's associated with, with it. Uh, and these curve numbers are actually per um, hydrologic soil group. So there's one for soil group A and one for soil group B, C, and D. Same thing, uh, literature, um, because this model is quite uh, widely used, um, there's uh, often some existing studies using this data or the US uh, Department of Agriculture has also some default data that one can use. Um, other inputs include the watersheds or sub-watersheds. So the user can define if they want to aggregate at a coarse or fine scale. Flood prone areas, uh, which can be based on um, historical information and observation. Uh, they can be available from uh, some of the um, local government agencies as well. Um, and finally, these buildings and damage cost for each building, which um, is an optional input if one wants to go to this valuation step. Um, so with all this input data, uh, the model will run and produce essentially these two uh, outputs. One is the raster of runoff retention as well as um, actual runoff. So we saw that the runoff retention is the difference between um, the input precipitation and the runoff uh, generated uh, on each pixel. Um, and so this will be one output as well as the runoff retention itself. Um, and then the shapefile will um, aggregate these values uh, to, to look at the runoff retention index, as well as in cubic meters. So both values are always uh, as a um, proportion uh, of the input, which is the precipitation, or uh, also as a volume or a depth in millimeter. The potential damage cost as well, if um, this is, uh, if the input was um, entered by the, the user, um, and this potential service, which is the product of runoff retention and damage cost. So 
before going to the, the application uh, and uh, hands-on demonstration of the model, I wanted to give you a sense of um, some of the limitations and also the, the next step. So the largest limitation of the model um, is essentially that we cannot look at um, the actual flood depth uh, that are predicted or estimated in an area. Um, so in terms of valuation, it, it's quite limiting. And so I wanted to share here some um, potential next steps in terms of model development or alternative ways using other models that one can go about uh, quantifying this, uh, these values. Uh, so CADIS, uh, which stands for Cellular Automata Dual Drainage Simulation, is one model that um, we have uh, tested with, uh, with some colleagues from the University of Exeter uh, to get at, at this question of um, flood depth in a spatially explicit way. Uh, so the model produces maps of water depth and velocity as a function of time um, using relatively simple inputs, uh, elevation, surface roughness, and infiltration as a raster. So it's still much um, more greedy than invest uh, in, in that sense. Um, and it um, produces a relatively rapid simulation, but need calibration. So that's one of the downside of a lot of these more sophisticated models where you need a um, stronger hydrologic modeling background and often need to, to calibrate the model. The beneficiaries and valuation step of, of that model can be, as I mentioned, um, to look directly at the property values as a function of, of water depth. Um, and so essentially overlaying the inputs, the outputs of the biophysical model, the, the flood depth, uh, with information on infrastructure or population affected. Um, so as an example for um, a test um, golf course actually in um, Minnesota, um, uh, my colleague Ben Jenke ran the model and obtained this map of flood depth here on, on the slide for a 100 year storm um, for the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Um, so essentially all the darker colors um, represent higher flood depth up to three, three meters. Um, and, and this is the information that we can overlay with uh, the population or, or infrastructure data. Uh, so that's uh, what this might look like. Uh, if we look at the building information in, in gray or information on um, census block, so population income age, perhaps more vulnerable uh, people to, to flood. And so by overlaying this information, we can get a finer um, understanding of the, the value of flood risk mitigation. So that's essentially what I wanted to share with you uh, today. And um, we will just go through a, a live demonstration of, of the model to make sure that the, this is uh, well understood where the inputs go and how one goes about interpreting the model outputs. All right, so this is uh, what the user interface uh, looks like. Um, so these are all the inputs uh, for the model that we, we explained earlier. And essentially running the invest model means uh, entering all these data uh, with the um, data pre-processed by the user and then running the model. So the first is the workspace uh, and that's essentially anything um, that the user decides um, for where you want to um, write the outputs. Um, same thing for the results suffix, anything that's the, the name of the results. Uh, so we can call it test today. Watershed vector. So this is the uh, watershed that is needed, all sub-watersheds. Um, so you see that these check green checks will appear as, as 
I speak. Um, for depth of, of rainfall, this is uh, the design storm depth. Uh, so for Singapore, um, we use here 105 millimeters uh, based on the uh, water utility uh, guidelines. Uh, and we also look at the land cover raster. So here we're going to use a raster that we've pre-processed. Soil hydraulic to group and biophysical table. So perhaps we can take a quick look before entering uh, this input. So this is what the uh, had the biophysical table will look like. Um, you can see that it's actually missing some information, so I'm going to use a different one. Uh, but that's uh, the curve numbers for A, B, C, and D that are, uh, I was mentioning for each land use land cover code. And Okay. Same physical table here. Um, and um, that's about it. We're not going to use the this um, optional input, so we just click run and wait for the model outputs. And the model has completed successfully. And um, so we can now check the model outputs by opening the workspace and look at the different outputs that the model has produced. So to visualize them, um, I will bring up here QGIS. Um, and so we can start with the shape file um, and look at the type of outputs that the, the model produces. I'm actually going to include them all. And I just wanted, before we go into these outputs, this is also an important uh, log file um, with a summary of all the inputs. And also, if there's any error, this is where you'll find some um, of the important information to uh, debug the model. But so focusing first on our shape file, we can look, we can look at the different attributes. Um, so the model produced the runoff retention index um, as a percentage and a um, value in cubic meters, uh, as well as the flood volume. So this is the actual um, runoff, uh, total uh, runoff, not the retained volume. Um, so of course, if we want to represent this in a more visual way, uh, one might want to uh, graduate and represent this as a function of the potential. So classify and apply. So now we, we see um, proportionally which watersheds are actually have the highest retention value. And so behind this data, it's essentially these data sets uh, here. Um, so the this is the first step of the model. This is the runoff produced by the model. Um, and this is the runoff retention. So uh, if we subtract this runoff value from the precipitation value. Um, and this is the retention um, as a percentage. So you see these are values between zero and one. So that's essentially it for the for today. Thanks for listening and um, of course, uh, I wanted to reiterate as well that all this information is in the model um, user's guide uh, that one can find on the Natural Capital Project, the INVEST user's guide. Thank you and have fun running the model.